the end of the show. Then. Maybe. Tim, great to have you back. Oh, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, to Stephanie, you guys. great to have you on too. Thanks to have me again too. It's really, it's good to see you guys all even video. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Tim, are, are you guys ever going to go back to the office? June 30th, the next year from what I hear. June 30th of 2021? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah they told, told us to make plans till then. Yeah. Yeah, no, I knew that, but I, I, I saw some headline today about how people may never go back. Well, there's probably some, but this is really, uh, you know, we were kind of going a little bit this route, you know, more working from home, but not totally where uh, this really poured kerosene on it. I mean, yeah. the, it's, it's our uh, people engagement scores are way up. Uh, people are really liking it. I, uh, you know, I think it's, put an extra step in a few of our, uh, our, uh, our bounces, you know, it's been, yeah. it's been good and productivity is huge for us. It's been really, I know. I know. everybody's saying that, but here's my question. Yeah. Look, we all grew up in a system where we all work together. So I know each other and all that. What, how do you grow a new generation of people who have never been together before? Yeah, that's, that's the hard part. Uh, Cause you know, I'm cashing in, chits of things over the years i've been in the company for 37 years and know a lot of people and hey, i just need one more from you right how do you bring how do you get the right. 28 year old engineer that, that that doesn't know you just knows of you to say hey i really need you to help me on this or hey you're doing a great job so it's you know picking up the phone it's calling them uh telling them they're doing a great job or being available hey give me a call i've been around for a long time so but it it, it takes a, a bit more effort it's not as organic you have to kind of put a lot of effort into it so it's new for us but you know what uh us old dogs can learn new tricks yeah <laughs> I, I was thinking about that that uh, that that element of it well i mean starting a new job in a new company right now would be that much more difficult from yeah. not having that interaction i was thinking about it yeah. in some of the media interviews and stuff that we've been doing knowing that it's gonna you know getting a chance to see you even on video tim and yeah. hadn't seen you in a while and and yeah. some of the other calls and and john and gary you know we all know a, a lot of people and and for us, it's easy to get on with video or phone with some of these people that we've known for years. But if you're just coming into the industry, it's it's got to be a little bit more, just to brash it up a little bit more intimidating than it was if it's yeah. somebody that you got to sit next to at, at a lunch or a breakfast or something before you, you had to interview them. Yeah, my son did it. He uh, was at Procter & Gamble, now at uh, uh, Covacent, I think, or he went to another a big pharma company. Uh, and, and he, he, uh, you know, got onboarded totally virtually. Yeah, well, it's, I it's mean, my tough. boss is in London, so I was, <laughs> but at least I had the office here to, to go to, 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 yeah. um, catch up with people. And, sure. and it's, it's, it's different. I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to going back to an office at some point. I've always liked a mix of working from home and the office, yeah. um, Working from home a hundred percent of the time is we we've been back job. we've been back in a few times, you know, to get vehicles reflashed, mm -hmm. to go and do some things. Uh if we need to collaborate, because there's some things you just can't do over the phone, uh, or even by video, you need to be in the same room. Mm -hmm. So how's yeah. your productivity doing with the people who are at home? Uh, really well. Uh, you know, we really haven't missed a beat uh from when we brought the plants down. Uh, it moved our resources to other projects and then now bringing them all back up and moving the people back in. And uh, it's it, the productivity has been huge, been a big gain for us. The hard part is disengaging, right? Before I had a 40 minute drive home, now it's mm -hmm. 14 stairs, you know, <laughs> from the basement upstairs. <laughs> it, sometimes not quite enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, get the show going officially here. All right. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vassiloy. <laughs> Let me do that again. 
This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 524 for September 20. And again, this is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 524 for September 10th of 2020, talking GM product with GM's product guy. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Borg Warner. Propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. And by Keykurt, technology that leads. Hey, Gary. John, it's been, it's been a while. We missed last week. I know, I know. We, we did. And boy, this industry, there, it never sleeps. There's so That's... much to talk about. We're going to have a great uh, conversation coming up with Tim Herrick in a minute, but Later on in the show, we got to get into all this GM and Nicola stuff, because as you know, the social media world has erupted. It has indeed. And um, so, you know, I, I often find something that happens on this very day. And I, I find it sort of interesting in the context of what you just said, that on September 10th, 2009, General Motors had announced that it was going to be selling 55% of Opal to Magna and a Russian bank. And then in November, they said, no, 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 never, never mind. We're not going to do that. This is too important. We need, we need to have Opal and Vauxhall in our, in our portfolio. And then March, 2017, see ya. Yeah. So you, all these changes that happened just within a very short period of time. And these past couple of weeks have probably made that look punk. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you looked that up because I had forgotten all about the Magna Russian bank connection to Opal. Yeah, they were going to get 55% of the company. General Motors was going to hold um, 35%, and then the remaining 10% was going to go to workers. And then that just well, went gone. Yeah. Good thing that that didn't happen because now that Opal's with uh, Peugeot, things look bright for Opal. Mm -hmm. and, and plus, it would have probably... Uh, caused many automakers not to have the uh, resource of uh, Magna building cars for them. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I hadn't thought of that. Hey, we got to bring Stephanie Brindley from IHS Market in here. Hey, hey guys. Hi, how are you today? Good. 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 So uh, you heard what we were just saying. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm about. with you. I had forgotten the Opal Magna uh, yeah. scenario. Um, and September 20, 2009 was a pretty busy time, as I recall, too. Um, no, I had forgotten about that. But yeah, GM and Nicola, this news this week was interesting, and GM and Honda last week. So we've got plenty mm -hmm. of GM product stuff to talk about today. And, and with that, the perfect segue, let's bring Tim Herrick in here. Hey, John. Hello, Tim. Hey, Gary. Hi, Tim. Stephanie. Good to see you guys. Hey. Doing well. Good to see you guys yeah. again. Tim, it's great to have you back on the show. Uh, I think the last time that we had you on, you were chief engineer for the full-size pickup program. Now you're vice president of global products for the whole company. So y your portfolio has expanded <laughs> immensely. Yeah, it's uh, it's grown a, grown a little bit. Yeah, I have all the internal combustion engines uh, and the programs uh, that they're in uh, for the company, you know, kind of expanding from the truck role and and the executive chief of the full-size trucks that franchise, just a, a nice progression to, to move in to be VP for a lot of products. Yeah. Why did GM split that? I mean, the, the EV operations went off into their own organization. You, you got everything that remains. Is it because ICEs and EVs are just that different that it made sense to split the organization? You know, I think from a focus standpoint, you're going to, you're spending a, great deal of resources there to bring those up, stand those businesses up, uh, bring the product online. You know, it takes it takes a focus. And then it also takes a, a team that's uh, working on, uh, you know, the other franchises, the, the truck franchise, the uh, crossover franchise, uh, 
you know, mid-sized truck franchises, just to keep those going and, and keep it those uh, moving along. And then supporting, uh, you know, as we pivot the company to the to our EV future. So having, having the right focus, getting, you know, putting the right energy and getting the right, uh, you know, timing to, to, to move people and resources just made a lot of sense. So, so Tim, when you were going through that that list of of types of vehicles, you mentioned a whole lot of trucks and crossovers. You didn't say much about cars. Um, can can I find something in that, or is that just no? Uh, you know, I, you know I, was, I was born to be a truck guy, so sometimes uh, you know, <laughs> as as uh, Corvettes were uh, just until recently were uh, were in our stable, but uh, now now they moved over to the EV side. Uh, you know, we, we do have uh, Malibus, we have uh, some, some of the cars, the bands, you know, everything that uh, falls in there. So it's it's just maybe a, a bad habit of mine that, uh, you know. Or a good habit. Guy. Well, and there's do make money in them. That's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> and money's good. Uh, yeah. No, is, is there a point to where where are you interfacing with your with the other team? Because some vehicles will have electrification and ICEs, and so is there a, a set point when you might jump in on there, or does it just depend on the project? It just depends on the project. You know, as as we uh, move resources, pivot resources to uh, to help them out. Uh, Ken and I talk all the time. Uh, Ken Morris and I talk all the time <laughs> about. Uh, you know, what resources he needs, what we can move back and forth. How can we help him go faster? How can we, you know, help uh, unburden some of the load? Uh, you know, just just things like that. So I'm um, hoping to, but we'll see. I'm having a great time doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, when the phone rings, uh, my boss calls, it's like, what do you need? What can I help you with? Tim, let's so talk did, about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go, Gary. Go, ahead, go, go after you. No, I was just going to say, let's talk about some of the product that's just starting to hit the streets right now. Your yeah. new full size utilities, yeah. all new from the ground up. Yeah. Uh, I've driven a couple of them. I guess I can't talk about one of them, but uh, what the the one thing I can say that I think doesn't give it away too much. And of course, we're talking suburban, Tahoe, Yukon, yeah. Escalade. You're welcome uh, to talk about those and how much you love them, John. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let, let me just make this, and, th and then you start to fill in the blanks. Refinement, quietness, sophistication. Th th those are some of the words that just come out of, uh, of my uh, brief test drives in these things. Th those have got to be some of the key attributes you really focused in on. Yeah, just taking it to the next level, taking a great product that we have 40% of the market share in, in 2019, continue to just what customers love and continue to ratchet that up. Uh, refinement, independent rear suspension, the the ride, everything that uh, that we we put in there. The quietness, you, where uh, you know we really sealed the vehicles up and did a great job with that. And you've seen that over the years as as uh, you know we learn, we we do better. You know, next truck, best truck, right? We just continue to to pour in our knowledge on them and and uh, the refinement. And then, you know, just the the, the clever uh, Easter eggs, if you will, from towing technology to quietness of the diesel engine that's in there to the quietness of, of the overall vehicle uh, to how smooth it rides down the road. I mean, it's a marked difference between uh, what came before. And that was a, certainly a conscious effort to make that so. There's lots of clever technology. I, I was enjoying to the uh, wireless CarPlay, which is not specific to just those two vehicles, but um, it makes it just that much easier and it stayed connected and it behaved really well. And again, the cameras, you know, came from the full size pickup trucks, too. So I'm not sure how much they were changed for the full size SUVs, but I backed one of them out of my driveway at about 530 in the morning the other day and the camera was super clear. Yeah. It's still, there, it, it. I don't know. You might be able to tell me from a technology viewpoint. I mean, where is it pulling that light from? My street doesn't have a light on it, so it, it pulled enough light from the environment somehow to give me a clear vision, and I was able to back out and not hit my own car, which was even better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the digital technology we put in there. You have backup lights, right? So we pick up as yeah. much as that ambient light as uh, as we possibly can, or the light that comes from the from the backup lights. Uh, you know, we really dial that in. We make sure mm -hmm. that uh, we put the best camera technology in there because it's important to see 
when you're backing up, you got the the guiding lines, as you mentioned, yep. for not hitting something else that's there so you can see it. Those guiding lines and, uh, you know, they're within millimeters of where you end up. You can really trust them. You put them so they're not going to hit the vehicle back there and skirt around it. You can get, I can guarantee that you're not going to. So we put a lot of work into that and just, there was no stone unturned or no technology that we didn't look at them uh, to make it better, easier. Our customers really spoke to us about that. And I think the, the sliding power console will probably get a bit more use than it even sounds like. I mean, I, I was talking with somebody else about that um, as well. And it's to me, it's the difference between maybe having a manual car seat and a power car seat. You've got that, you could make a center console that, that had steps and you could move it back and forth, but adding the power to it gives you a lot more variability. It makes it smoother when it acts and it just it opens up a little bit space and you've got that little cubby down there to have a little hidden yeah. space in there. And that's yeah. it's pretty clever too. All in all, it's it's touches that that reflect that you understand how people are using the vehicle. Yeah, that, that center console is an interesting story. I won't go too deep into it, but uh, we, we brought in, we paid some customers to come in, some neighbors of some of our, uh, some of our directors and planning brought them in, paid them and signed an NDA with us. And that came out of a, like a three or four day workshop. There were a lot of other ideas that one rose to the top uh, and we, we put it into production and there was a lot of, you know, the, the customer clinic data wasn't huge when we took it out to the customers. However, we believed in it so much. And, it, you know, Stephanie, as you said, it's, it's got uh, the little cubby in there that you can fit certain th things into it and hide them when you want to, that uh, you can, uh, you can put a gallon of milk in there. When you, when you back it up, you can move the cup holders closer to the rear seat. Uh, you know, for those occupants back there, if you want to do that, uh, you're, you can put your purse, you can, store all kinds of, you know, carry out stuff, which is huge right now for all of us, right? To get it home. And right. so, yeah, it, it was, there was, um, we, we bet on it and uh, we, we bet right. I think so. so. You mentioned the independent rear suspension and passing, but that is really a big deal in terms of changing much of the packaging in the inside of the car. Yeah. Tell us about that. And the other thing that I find to be interesting is that you guys are offering air suspension as well as Magna Ride on this. So, so you know, John said yeah. that he found a refined ride. This, I think, contributes a lot to that. So explain that to us, please. Yeah, um, the independent rear suspension, I, can re I won't tell you the year, but I can remember the day. It was June 15th at 10.30 a.m. <laughs> when um, I, uh, I, I, I got that finally approved. It was something that I felt very strongly as the executive chief engineer to put in. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there, were, if there was anything our customers told us, it was the, uh, the, the, the size of the aperture in the back, the flat load floor, the third row accommodations, kind of in that order uh, that we wanted to improve on. And that was the silver bullet. So then we, max, we maximized uh, how we rolled that out with the, we drew a line on the floor exactly where we wanted it uh put it put everything packaged everything below it and then we went and put all the right bits and components the right uh joints in there for the rear suspension we know who our competition is we took theirs apart understood uh the mistakes that they made and continue to have in their vehicle that we improved on to give it a great ride uh then we coupled it with their suspension and I uh, won't tell you who it was, but I got some pictures over the weekend of, of, of some of our top executives with their motorcycles on the back, just waxing eloquently of how much they loved the vehicle. So we, we were, they were happy with this this weekend as they drove that around. So that Magna ride coupled with the air, you know, and that goes right to John's statement of uh, refinement and, and uh, just really uh, pleasant to where you you notice a big difference. It's a step function difference, and then not only did we do it just for ride, but we did it for everything else, every accommodation. You know, no, there was uh, there's ten inches more of uh, leg room in the third row now in a Tahoe. We lengthened it out to you know it's only four percent longer, but it's sixty six percent more cargo room. So we really listened to the customers and really uh, integrated that in. So uh, June fifteenth at ten thirty a.m. and uh, you know, kind of 
we talked a lot about it going right for the customer and, and what we had to do to get it done. So proud moment. Thanks for noticing. I actually found the uh, third row center seat actually very quite comfortable back there. And mm -hmm. I mean, seriously comfortable. So I think that that whole uh, change of getting rid of that suspension system back there really made a big difference. And I think people are absolutely going to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. You saw some of our competition as we were coming in and they probably found out about it, that what they were doing to advertise to kind of blunt it, but uh, to no avail, right? It was, it's, uh, we're taking the, taking the product by storm right now. A lot, a lot of, yeah. A lot of sales, a lot of great input, a lot of great feedback. Thanks. Tim, I got a question about the IRS. If you get go to the back of the vehicle and you look under underneath, yeah, uh, you know, under the bumper, that is, there's two big round dials that are part of the IRS, the independent rear suspension, that look like they allow for a lot of adjustment. I don't know if it's camber or what. What what are those things and why so much adjustment available? Yeah, that would be the that would be the the camber in the in the back. Just with the variation, when you have a frame and how you put a frame together and all the bits and pieces that you put up, we dial those in. It's one of the last things we do at the assembly plant as we uh, bring it up. Uh, do the, take the front uh, caster camber and toe in, and then we dial in the back. We lock it all down. So uh, that that's what we use to make sure that it tracks down the road straight. That you have. Uh, great ride and handling, you know, just, you know, if our experience with Corvette, just small little changes in, in camber or caster can cause, uh, cause things that you really don't like as much in the vehicle. So that's, uh, that's the adjustment that we put in there. That's kind of the, the refinement and the bits and pieces that we put in. Yeah, no, look, I, I understand about, you know, uh, the stack up of tolerances, uh, yeah. especially on a vehicle like that. But this is a range of adjustment like I've never seen before. I wonder if it's also due to the, the great variety of wheels and tires that you offer on this. Yeah, there's there's some there's some of that that you put in there, but it's mostly just uh, you know the uh, to take up any variation that you might see, so we can uh, give the customer exactly what we intend them to, to get. Okay, one other quick one, then I'll give you back to Gary and Stephanie yeah. here. But when you pop the hood. There's like this little tray that's right behind the leading edge. Uh, part of it's got uh, air intake. And then there's this other like, I don't know how to describe it, but there's... Cheese, this, cheese grater. Yeah, what is that? That that's, uh, we, we actually call it the cheese grater. And, and I, I when you started dis discussing it, I can, I wouldn't say it's lastly, but I, Jim, the engineer that actually... Uh, developed it. What that does is that cheese grater, the uh, the pieces, the undulations in it, as well as the different holes. As as uh, and you can see all the seals that we put around it um, to to seal it up. As it draws air in, and then and takes it into the engine, it separates water and any debris out of it through that oh, that cheese grater. And then very it gets clever. To clean it. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's very clever. We we paid him for a good patent on that. And uh, and uh, it, it gets really clean air uh, and a lot of it. It's the best way in, uh, to get the volume of air that you need and, and clean to the to the air filter, to the engine, and then to the wheels. So I want to ask you about the transmission. Um, it's yeah. called a push button transmission, but it sort of strikes me that <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. you know, and and it almost seems that you guys sized the indents for people to be wearing gloves. Yeah. Is, is that yeah. just my imagination or is that something that you guys did? No, uh, we, we go to the 95th percentile, right? And, and for, from a hand size, a glove size, we know that we, we've been doing trucks for a long time and super successful in it uh, as we lead the industry. And, and so we know our customers and that's something that was given the feedback uh, as well as, you know, we, we had, we looked at everything from different, from dials to, push buttons to uh, how, how we had it here. This is um, with the, the pull um, and, and push for neutral. It's, uh, it's the best way to make sure that the customer and the transmission the vehicle interface and have, uh, have zero uh, ambiguity as to know what gear it is and how to get it there. Because mm -hmm. some of the others uh, don't have that. 
And on the terrain, you introduced a, a push pull that was down yep. toward the bottom, and you've uh, moved it back back up on the on the Yukon. Um, is that it, it, why was that? Why did you decide to put it up higher? Is that just because it fit there better from a design perspective? Is it about a usability factor? Is it because you used to have the column stock, and then this puts it closer to that for what people are used to? You know, a, a little bit of all of those, but mostly the the uh, the real estate in the center console, even though, it, you know, in the terrain, as you mentioned, that's, you know, that's uh, uh, real estate that you want to take, right? In the, our truck customers, that that center console, how it works, how much storage they have, uh, that's downtown Tokyo real estate to them. And so to, to, uh, to, to have it in the right spot, to move it up there uh, in, in your line of sight, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, was uh, the best design for us. And the design team did a great job to make it look integrated uh, in the right spot. Yeah. Tim, you mentioned the three liter um, turbo diesel that you have. Um, talk to us about the other powertrains that are available for the vehicle. Uh, you have a, a five, th all of them have 10 speeds. Uh, that's one thing that we consciously did and, and we're able to do uh, from, from the uh, full size utilities. Then you, you have a, you have a 5.3 that you can, with a 10-speed that you can put in. You have a 6.2 uh, with the 10-speed, and then you have the three-liter diesel with the 10-speed. Uh, some some of them they're standard by trim, and we can get you that information. But as you walk up, and you can pick uh, which powertrain you want, uh, and then again some are some are standard. And then the diesel, I don't know if you guys have driven that. You certainly drove it in the the light-duty pickup truck. You know the most fuel-efficient um, uh, vehicle. In, in the galaxy um, for certainly by size and, and everything else, but uh, it's just a, you know, a great refinement, a great uh, powertrain. And uh, for the SUV, it's going to be something uh, really special again. Tim, I believe you've got the, the new GM electronic architecture in these vehicles yeah. that, that allows for over the air updates, doesn't it? And, uh, and, and what can you update? Oh, you can update virtually what's uh, we call VIP, what the uh, vehicle intelligence platform, um, you know, VIP, it's a cute name, uh, but, it, uh, you know, which is five times the capability and, and computing power. You know, we can reach out and touch every module over the air uh, through the through that uh, through that network. Uh, now, do we we don't always update every module. There's certain ones that you do and you don't want to, but. Uh, based on on some some criteria, but you can reach out and get uh, get any one of them, and it's something that's a uh, big force. We can we can make turns to software very quickly in calibrations. Uh, you know, even as they're even as they're leaving the plant, if we want to if we want a last minute tweak, uh, we we can do it right over the air and, and put them on their merry way. So the, the, the modules you do not want to have touched, is that for uh, a cybersecurity standpoint? There's, there's that. There's, you know, you know, safety reasons. There's, but, you know, we can virtually get to every one of them. Did I recall um, in the last week or so, there was not that, that recalls are what we're going to talk about, but um, Corvette did a, a recall. And if I recall correctly, the, the documentation said that it was going to be corrected by an over-the-air update. Yeah. Um, is that the first time? And and I think that's one of the potentials that you have for, for over the updates is being yeah. able to fix things without making consumers go to the dealership. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, with, the, with the frunk that they had uh, made a ch uh, change to. Yeah. That, I don't know if that was the first time or not. I don't, you know, I, I don't believe so, but um, you know, certainly one that got a lot of notoriety because I mean, you can see those Corvettes coming, right. We can, yeah. uh, uh, from a long way. And uh a lot of a lot of fun to drive. Uh, we we actually, as an aside, we we uh, took one to a wedding, and and uh, the bride was upset because it got more uh, attention than, than she would. Harsh, harsh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we yeah yeah that wasn't good. But uh, um, maybe not one of the first, but one of the most uh, talked about, and and that's what that's really an advantage. Uh, for any company that can do that. They don't have to come to the dealership. You don't incur any other, uh, you know, bringing it in, looking at it. Every time, you know, somebody else comes and touches your vehicle, there's an opportunity to, to screw something up. So this is a big advantage for us. Yeah. 
<laughs> Tim, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Your title includes the word global. So yes. what I mean, what do you see in terms of General Motors in its global vehicle portfolio? I mean, what, what are the things you're looking at and what are the differences? I mean, I'm I'm assuming that, for example, the these Yukons and, and the Escalade are not going to be sold in great numbers other places in the world. You know, the uh let's say say the Middle East uh for the for the Escalade, for the for the Tahoe, the Yukon. Uh, that's a big that's a big market for us. Mm. In fact, so big that uh, back in I think 2015, 2016, we went out and uh, and spent a week there uh, uh, looking at and talking, actually going and talking to customers right in their in their Magellus and and uh, finding out what they wanted. Some it inspired some things for us, uh, but to the point of uh, what uh, what do I have purview over? Uh, globally, it would be the the Middle East and the, and everything that goes in there. Uh, South America with uh, with our our products down uh, down there. The, the the cars that we put there and have launched there. The uh, China, uh, Korea. I have people in in uh, all those uh, all those areas and and vehicles in in all those regions that that we uh, we work hard every day to satisfy customers, uh, grow our base, and uh, grow our market share and grow our cash. <laughs> well, you're going to grow cash with those big SUVs, man. Yeah. I, I'm stunned at the market share that you have. I'm stunned at, I, you guys make like 340,000 a year or something like that. Yeah. Over, over 300. Yeah. It's a, it's a big number. It's, it's a big uh, number and, and they're very profitable. Yeah. It's a uh, very profitable. It's, you know, it's a, uh, it's the economic <laughs> engine that really drives our company it's a part of the it's the last piece of the truck franchise that is has rolling these things out and we talked about the light duty truck then the heavy duty truck you know this is the this is the uh cherry on top of the of the whole thing we uh you know have 40 percent of the market we uh, intend to give none of that none of that up and take as much as we possibly can and then uh you know with the refinement as you had talked about so uh, we're, we're, we're really proud of it. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the team in Arlington, Gary, I know that you have a manufacturing, uh, background and, uh, just what the team's done to convert that plant in the middle of, of, a of a pandemic. Right. We had, uh, we had volunteers go down to, uh, cause we were within just a few days of clearing the plant out. So we actually had volunteers that went down there, built out what we had left. Then the contractors came in, you know, we we really didn't miss a beat um, um, over overall from con converting that plant. Now they were down for a little bit longer, but then they came up to speed and uh, very quickly got vehicles shipped. Uh, I got my team down there right now as we're bringing all the variants up to speed and and online. And I, I can't say enough about just the Arlington team and and quite frankly the the whole manufacturing teams in uh at general motors right from the from building thirty thousand ventilators and we, you saw where we uh just got done done with that here just a little bit ago 10 million face masks those those lines didn't even exist mm -hmm. wow. so the the greatness and the power of uh of this company that when when things are down we can rally to to get it done my uh my my hat goes off to to the men and women of general motors that I didn't miss a beat at all and and just kept asking what they could do to go places to help out to to what what do you need Tim to to get this done and they they just didn't turn us down so really can't say enough about it uh you know in, in the middle of of what one of the certainly one of the worst things that's happened to our country in a in a long time uh you know a heart uh, heart goes out to all those affected by this, but a great team uh, and a great team rallies to to persevere and overcome. And Tim, I, I think that's the, the perfect note to wrap up this segment. Uh, it it, it is amazing what GM has been able to accomplish. Others too in the industry, but especially when you mention how it stepped up, the company stepped up to, to help fight the pandemic. Really good stuff. And I uh, want to thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's always great to see you guys. Hope to see you in person soon. Uh, right. If you have any questions about uh, any of our products, give me a call and 
and uh, we'll make sure you get the right answers. Okay. All right. Stay well. All right. Thanks yeah. to you too. Stay safe. Thanks. Take care. Okay. We're going to take a, a quick commercial break right now. We're going to come back and talk a lot more about what's going on in the industry and maybe learn a few things or two about Stephanie's cat. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to visit. <laughs> All right, we're back. Yeah, very interesting conversation with Tim there. I mean, I, I and I meant it. I, I am blown away. You know, he's talking forty percent market share uh, of the arguably the most profitable segment in the industry. That that that's a stunning stat. It, it is, and it's a it's a um, segment of the industry that's really found a, a settled space. I mean, it, it's not one that has a lot of of high end growth opportunity in terms of volume. It's, it's not going to get a lot bigger than it is. I mean, it comes and goes with the economy a bit. You know, we, we did see growth in the last few years as we were in a good space. Um, but it's the kind of vehicle for those people who want it. It's There's not really a secondary alternative for them. They use the capability of those vehicles and they're not going to make another choice. So you've got a pretty stable space compared comparatively to work with. Okay, so I know that we're going to get to Nicola and General Motors and Honda and General Motors. But before we get there, while we're talking about these these large vehicles that I know that we've all driven, now we haven't driven the Escalade yet. Um, but okay, giant, I mean, John, as you pointed out, I mean, the interiors of these things are beautiful. I mean, it's uh, there, there are screens all over the place. The the fit and finish is, is just extraordinary. So I got to ask you two guys, last week we saw the introduction of the Grand Wagoneer concept from Jeep. And, you know, these guys are talking about, okay, now we're going to be competing in this, this upper luxury tier in terms of full-size utilities. So Steph, to your point, I mean, is there a market for this stuff? I, they're going to have to take a little bit from someplace else. That's where we do see a little, we do see the segment growing a little bit and partly it is that new entry. Um, but their price point that they're talking about right now is, is aggressive. I mean, they're talking about starting at 60, which is a little bit more than you can get a GMC Yukon for um, and going well over a hundred. So it, it'll, it, they're aggressive on that front. And I think one of the challenges might be is if we do end up when, with a, a longer recessionary period, um, I'm not quite sure how, how they're going to get over that and where they're going to land. If you look at the Chevrolet and the GMC products, there are certainly some high-end versions, but you still have most of the Chevrolet is transacting a little bit lower and you can get into a Yukon for 52. So they've got a little bit more bandwidth if we do have a recessionary period and people start scaling back about on what they spend. Um, the, the Grand Wagoneer concept looked amazing. The interior looks phenomenal. Um, the exterior looks nice. I like some of the, the, the detail touches to it. The, the Wagoneer on the front looks really great. Um, but again, it's a concept, so we'll see how much of that comes through. Um, other than that, the, the exterior shape kind of looks what you expect it would, would look in that space. What do you think, Jen? Well, I, if I were Land Rover, I'd be worried because to me, the Grand Wagoneer is going right to the throat of the Range Rover. And, uh, you know, Jeep is a global brand. They don't have to worry just about trying to sell stuff in the American market as, as is Land Rover. But I mean, uh, I, I think this is a, a really smart move. I wish that I, I'll bet they wish they had brought these things out a couple of years earlier than they did, but I, I guess every car company wishes it had brought something out earlier than it did. Uh, I, I think this is the natural progression for Jeep. Uh, you know, people have been complaining loudly about the price of the, the Gladiator. 
sales are pretty good. You know, the, the high-end versions of the Wrangler, the high-end version of the, the Grand Cherokee, selling pretty well. So, I mean, to me, this is just a natural step for Jeep to step up into the top end of the SUV category. It's just you know, one of the things I wonder... Go ahead, Steph. I just said it's just a big step. When I was looking at the numbers. It's just a big step. I mean, Grand Cherokee today starts at 34. This is going to start at 60. Um, you've, you're, you're right. It's a logical step. My, my question is, is it going to be too big of a jump? And you do still have to, to get people to, to really want to, to get to that point. And if we're in a position where people are thinking a little bit differently on, on recessionary terms, that could be a, a, an issue, but, um, it, it's a big jump and you do have to get people to be thinking, Land Rover, Rain Range Rover can do it, but is that, is that consumer going to think of a Jeep in the same way? Um, so you really need to make sure that the Jeep consumers have that bandwidth and the Jeep intenders have that bandwidth. So it's, it's funny you mentioned the um, Grand Cherokee because in 94, um, they dropped the Grand Wagoneer. And at that point in time, it was on the same platform as, as the uh, Grand Cherokee. So it, it's, it's sort of interesting in that regard. But I want to ask you guys, okay, um, everyone seems to be saying the design of the Bronco is sensational. It respects the past, but brings it to the future. Um, what did you guys think about the design? I, I, I mean, I thought it was beautiful, but I just like, it, it didn't move me the way that the Bronco does. And the, and the exterior design, I agree. Um, yes. the, in, the interior seemed to be out, outstanding. And again, that's hard to say for sure we weren't there. So it's all about pictures. Right. But, um, you know, the exterior, and I, you know, this is a segment that needs to be boxy. It needs to be pretty tall. Um, I they think they tried to, to pull in some of the past in there, but one of the most obvious things about a Grand Wagoneer is the wood on the sides, which they're not going to do. And they didn't even try to do something like that, which is smart. I think if you try to do it, it might come off a little bit awkward. Um, so, you know, they, they tried to keep some of the character in there, but it's, it's a space that, that at that back end, it's tall and boxy and it needs to be in order to, to, to do what it be able to haul all the stuff that it needs to do. There's, you know, if you look at at, at um, Expedition and you look at Navigator and the and the GM products, where the design cues are are really in the front, or in some of the detailed bits. That that back half is a big box, uh, with not a lot of of play happening. And mm -hmm. and I think that's where we're seeing some of the 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 Grand Wagoneer exterior look exactly like we expected it to, but not necessarily um, changing the game. Yeah, I, I would agree with with everything that you're saying there, Stephanie. Um, the, the exterior, I, I will judge when I see it on the road. Yeah. Um, some cars just don't photograph well. I, I, I shouldn't say that. You, you don't capture the proportions exactly right. You know, I'll give you one great example. When GM came out with its uh, current heavy-duty trucks, there was a lot of criticism. People hated the front end styling. I said, you know, I'm going to wait until I see one on a construction site because that's the truck in its natural environment. I think it looks pretty good. I think they're doing a pretty good job with those heavy duty trucks right now. And you don't hear anybody complaining about the front end. So th there's a lot of piling on that happens with armchair experts saying they should have done this and they should listen to me and all that. So I'll hold off talking about the exterior styling until I see the Grand Wagoneer out on the road. That's a fair point. The things do look completely different on the road <laughs> um, than they do in this in the showroom or even in the design dome, right? Those Bronco pictures look pretty damn good to me, though. <laughs> fair point, Gary. Fair point. But, you know, what we've got to go back and look at is the original International Harvester Scout because it came out before the original Bronco. And, you know, some people are, are have been saying, oh, you know, that that Scout sure reminds me of the Bronco. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> the Bronco will remind you of the Scout. And uh, yeah. but I, I would say, you know, uh, for the Bronco versus the Bronco Sports, that's the one that everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's let's get to the uh, the elephant in the room. Um, 
Okay, I would I would basically make this argument. I'll throw this down and, and let you guys re respond to this. Um, you know, we just heard Tim Herrick talking about trucks and how they're the, the engine that is driving General Motors forward. And, you know, it seems to me that what we're seeing with, with Mary Barra is she's saying, you know what? That is great. We've got to do that. We've got to continue to do that. But we've got to look to a future. And it's a future that is going to be different than anything we've known in the history of this company. So last week, they announced that they were going to have an alliance with Honda. And I mean, and it's a pretty comprehensive alliance with Honda. I mean, it's not just, you know, sharing a platform here or there, but I mean, it's purchasing, it's engineering, it's R and D. I mean, it's, it's a lot of stuff. Okay. Which, you know, we know they've been working with Honda for, for some time now. I mean, we remember the old Saturn red lines that had the Honda engines in them. And then we had um, General Motors and Honda working together on fuel salt technology right along. And, and uh, they did announce um, some months ago that the, origin vehicle that uh, cruise automation is making. Um, Honda is going to be um, working with them on that. Okay. Then this week, we have the announcement that Nicola, that we had Trevor Milton on the show, I think it was uh, June 7th of this year. And out of nowhere, here we have General Motors is, is going to be building the Badger and doing a whole lot more in terms of engineering and execution of what, what that Nikola company's doing. So, I mean, are we seeing perhaps the most innovative car company in the world down at the Renaissance Center? We may be. I mean, one of the interesting things about the Nikola is, is that it's they've just scrapped their own powertrain propulsion system they're working on. They're like, no, forget it. We'll just get it from GM, which is a vote of confidence, I think, in the GM system. And then the day after announcing the Nikola announce, um, relationship, they announced the wireless battery management system, which is another um, key technology. And I think what's really important about that one and really about the Ultiums too, is the, the forward look at trying to make sure that the technology is, is flexible and scalable and that it can be repurposed and reused with as little effort as possible. It always takes effort, but as little as possible. From that perspective, I think that GM's history in making vehicles and having to adapt to different markets and different sizes and different conditions has taught them that you've got to be flexible and you've got to figure out how to make this adaptable and that's going to be part of the key. And as they get closer to building them, we're starting to see some of that information trickle out. John. Yeah, uh, to me, uh, very interesting what GM is doing with both Honda and Nikola. You know, uh, it GM has been criticized heavily online uh, this week because everybody remembers all its failed joint ventures with other car companies. You know, it had Saab that went nowhere. It, ha it was it had Subaru that went nowhere. It was tied in with Isuzu and Suzuki that went nowhere for it. It had that disastrous relationship with Fiat, which, I mean, Fiat just took GM to the cleaners on that deal. So everybody's very skeptical about this. But I'll say this: <laughs> number one, with the Honda deal, Honda doesn't mess around. I mean, mm -hmm. Honda's never done another deal with another company to this extent ever in its history. This must have been an agonizing decision internally for Honda. Or, or maybe agonizing is not the right word, but they went through this with a fine tooth comb. It's, it's only in North America. It doesn't extend to Japan or other places of the world. Nonetheless, Gary, as you point out, it's significant. And the Nikola deal, how could you turn it down? I mean, it's free money for General Motors, free money and additional production capacity. So Nikola is going to give GM $2 billion in stock and GM's going to engineer the Badger, right? Well, that means all it has to do is productionize the body and the interior because everything under the skin is already done. Moreover, GM's got this battery plant in Ohio, which by my estimation, can supply enough electric vehicles to the tune of 350,000 to 400,000 vehicles a year. How fast can GM itself absorb all that production capacity? I mean, you know, the hope is that they can do it all on their own, but 
if I'm Mary Barra, I want to hedge my bets. Hey, Honda, you want to do a deal and you want to take some of this? And now, Nikola, you want to give me $2 billion for me to productionize your body and interior? It's a no-brainer. Why could you not do it? Uh, it to me, it, it's really good. And I think with everything that we've been talking about here, GM is on a roll. So, Stephanie, I want to ask you that as, as, as you look at you know, the, what the Badger conceivably will be, and is, is General Motors better off with this deal with Nikola than it would have been had it gotten the deal with Rivian? That that's a good question. I think that um, to to John's points, what he, he's just said, this one's easier um, for for GM. It gives them a bit more scale, and the responsibility for selling them is completely on Nikola. So there's the agreement of, and they didn't discuss volume, how many badgers they're agreeing to make. But once GM makes them. If Nicola has a trouble selling them, that's all on Nicola, and GM still has their money for building them. It, it, it's a it's an easier situation in some respects, um, and I think that both of these, um, even though the the Honda one is fairly broad within North America, both of them are, are very strategic, and Ford has been making very strategic partnerships, and maybe that's what we're going to see the automotive industry do a little bit more. It's less about buying another company or merging with another company as a whole and more about finding finding slices that you can work together really well. Um, and I think that's what, part of what we're seeing with what's happening with GM right now too. And, and remember with the, the Rivian deal, Ford had to give Rivian half a billion dollars. In the GM Nikola deal, Nikola is giving GM $2 billion right. in stock, but still. Uh, I, I think that, that that's a key differentiation of how the two deals went together. Yeah. And, you know, that stock, if it, you know, I was thinking about it, obviously, if it goes, if it, it continues to gain value, then it's good for GM. But, you know, if it, if it loses a little bit of money on there, you know, there's always some times that, that uh, you, you need a little bit of a loss to balance out the financials, not, not a, a, a deep loss, but it might, it's not that big of a deal if the stock price goes down, I think, for, for GM. And it it's, seems like, to your point, John, it's it's kind of a no-brainer. Sure, give me some money to build your truck. I can do that. So so in the announcement, it said, quote, a strategic partnership that begins with Nicola Badger and carries cost reductions through Nicola's programs, including the Nicola Badger, the Nicola Trey, Nicola One, Nicola Two, and NZT. So here's my question. What, is, what does Nicola do? Yeah, that's still the question. Honestly, I, you know, in in on the media call, um, Nicola's CEO tried to explain it, but I, I don't feel like it was a, a very thorough explanation. He mentioned something about UX and being able to to share to take your vehicle profile and your preferences from from one Nicola to another, and I feel like GM can do that now. Yeah. So, not sure they need Nicola to make that happen. I'm not sure at this point. Right now, for GM. It's scale for whatever they can sell, but I, you know, when Nikola drops their propulsion system, and then then where's their innovation? How is this an innovative startup if they weren't able to kind of get it to that finish line? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I I thought it was it was very 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 telling in in the quote that Trevor Milton gave that went out in the news release, and the quote begins. Nicola is one of the most innovative companies in the world. General Motors is one of the top engineering manufacturing companies in the world. I mean, I, I thought, how ironic is this? This guy's cutting this deal with this with this giant automaker, but puts Nicola first. Yeah. Oh, come on, of course. No, it's his company. Oh, that be... <laughs> and, and John, okay, so so John, when we had Trevor on the show. Yeah. I mean, didn't you get the sense from him that he basically said, you know what, you know, we're, we're the coolest thing in town. We know everything we have, we, you know, we're disruptive, we're innovative, those traditional companies, they can't do anything. They don't understand the kids. I understand the kids. They don't, you know, we got street cred. They got nothing. I mean, is, is yeah, he just, you, what's going look, on? Every entrepreneur has got to exude confidence and optimism. Even when everything else is crashing and burning all around them, they've got to come out and say, look at all the great stuff. 
starting a company is a really, really hard thing to do. And you've got to maintain that, that optimism and confidence, no matter what's, what's happening. And you've got to tell everybody that I, look, he's trying to raise when he was on the show, still trying to raise all kinds of money. He still had not, uh, done his reverse merger. He, he came on talking about what they were going to do. So of course he's got to talk like this. Elon Musk is the exact same way. All entrepreneurs are have that that same kind of personality. So sure, you know, look, Nikola has zero technology, none whatsoever. It was its partners, Bosch and Hanwha, the, the South Korean photovoltaic cell manufacturer, and CNH, or Iveco as it's commercially known, being able to build these trucks. That's what he pulled together. What, what Trevor has really done, though, that has taken uh, uh, the trucking industry, I'm not going to say by storm, but certainly made the trucking industry sit up and pay attention, is he's selling a subscription for semi-trucks. You pay him by the mile. So uh, Anheuser-Busch signed up and said, hey, we'll, we'll take 800 of your trucks. Because Trevor says, you pay me 93 cents a mile and I'll take care of everything. I'll take care of the truck, all the maintenance, even the fuel. You know, all you have to do, uh, Mr. Trucking Company, is put a driver in there and maybe someday we'll put in autonomy. But all you have to do is put a driver in there and drive the routes and we'll put fuel stations along the routes. So it's that that combined thing of where you're merely subscribing a truck, which the trucking companies love or the, the, anybody who does any kind of hauling. Anheuser-Busch does not want to be in the fleet management of trucks. It doesn't want to worry about the maintenance and the insurance and uh, forget all that. Dump that all on Nikola. And that's the real revolution that, in my opinion, that Trevor Milton's talking about. And it's a, it's one that is probably easier to apply to a commercial scenario than a personal one. When you talk about, you know, you or I having a subscription to a car, we're not talking about managing you know, a fleet of 50 vehicles. So for us to get into our insurance and find out the right best insurance for us is probably worth our time. Um, but you're right, somebody like Anheuser-Busch and just let them take care of it. Even even if it's, it can be one of those that even if it is a little bit more expensive for them to, to do the subscription than it would be for them to do all of that in-house, it's less complex, it's easier over time and, and there's a definite business payoff to doing that. And all they got to do is build all those hydrogen stations. So stay tuned. Okay. So, so last night there was a big car introduction. We, we can't not talk about this. The Lucid Air finally made its big debut. So again, we're talking here about um, a vehicle that is an electric vehicle in this case that starts at 80 grand and goes up to $169,000. Um, starts Steph at 80 grand in two years when the base version comes out. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so what do you think, Stephanie? Oh, you know, at that price point, one of the things that's nice about that price point is it's going to be low volume to begin with. So it's going to take a while to figure out how hot and, and demand it, it, it really is. There's are not that many buyers at that, at that number um, compared to, to um, a, a mainstream vehicle. Um, it's, they're going to be interesting to watch. Um, I think that when I was going through the, the materials and, and stuff, their, their customer base that they're talking about is, is fairly specific in terms of mindset. We want these progressive people that are forward thinking and, and it does mean that there might not be as many of them. So they're definitely, they're carving out an interesting little, little niche in there. Um, and, and how do you, if you engage with the, the version of progressive that we have today, do you engage with the version of progressive that we have in five or 10 years, because that person and what they expect might be different. Um, but it, it, we're just kind of waiting to see. They also claim that they're innovative and, and, and disruptive, but there's a lot of elements of what they're doing that we've seen from Tesla and that we're seeing other companies adapt. Um, so in terms of their business model, I'm not sure I'm seeing entirely innovative or disruptive things. Um, they might have been three years ago if they'd been on time. They've also, it's a story too of, of being you know, really committed to what you're doing because they were supposed to have revealed this car several other times and it was supposed to be in production before and they ran into issues building a plant and all sorts of things, but you know, they, they kept at it and, and, and they're coming to market. 
Yeah, my take on uh, Lucid is, uh, you know, building on what Stephanie said, uh, what are they bringing new to the party? I mean, you know, they're they're talking longer range than the Tesla Model 3, or, or uh, excuse me, uh, Model S. Model S. Uh, faster. Well, okay, you know, Tesla can probably tweak its stuff and, and match them at some point, too. But I will say this. One thing that intrigued me, and I didn't know this about Lucid before until th this announcement, they actually build all the battery packs for the Formula E race cars. So, and, and it's their technology, their battery stuff. So maybe they are bringing something new to the party here. Now, is that enough to make people say, whoa, whoa I got to run down and buy a Lucid Air? I don't know. But I do know that you're never going to head, get ahead as a startup in, in the automotive industry unless you bring something new to the party. You got to be very, and I'm not just talking styling and, and right. performance specs. You got to bring new technology. You got to bring new business processes and things like that if you're really going to stand out and survive. I thought it was interesting too. There's a contrast between um, Cadillac a couple of weeks ago introducing the Lyric and introducing their more the comparatively um, EV volume um, SUV first, where they've talked about their flagship um, sedan hatchback um, EV for Cadillac, but they haven't shown it publicly yet. And Lucid did it the other way around, showed the ultra expensive, the prettier car, the flagship model, and they're gonna talk about, they, there was an illustration of the utility vehicle, but they weren't showing that yet. And, and I think the idea of going going for that emotion and going for, for that aspiration first, yeah, we know you're going to sell more utility vehicles because that's what people are buying. But people don't fall in love with utility vehicles until they're in their family and they're using them on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's not the thing that you necessarily go, that is what I'm dreaming about tonight. Green uh, Wagoneer, come on. It's no, I'm not dreaming about it tonight. <laughs> no, but you, you do. You, I, so I did see that there was a little bit of a contrast in, in the two companies' approach to that. Um, and I think in terms of setting an image and and setting a tone for for the brand, Lucid's approach um, tells us more about what to expect from Lucid than than showing the utility vehicle that is in the biggest utility vehicle segment that's rapidly becoming highly commoditized first before showing the really exciting one. So speaking of giant expensive vehicles, uh, also last week we saw the uh, Mercedes S-Class. And, right. um, you know, I was like, so, so for the first half of 2020, Mercedes has sold a whopping 8,600 S-Classes. What kind of business is this? Well, you're you're talking just U.S. sales, correct? Right. So my guess is. Oh, I'm the, sorry, the sorry, sorry. Numbers. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. That was Model S was 8,600. S class was 4,183. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the global volume is probably three times that, maybe four times that, and it is the halo of the yeah. Mercedes-Benz brand. I mean, it's a. And look, I was very skeptical. It's like, oh, here we go, another big expensive Mercedes S class sedan. But as I started to dig into the details, the engineering in that car is spectacular. You can point to anything on the car, anywhere, under the skin, in the interior, on the outside, everything. The amount of engineering that went into it is just mind boggling. Now, they charge a lot for it, and they'll probably leave it in production for at least eight years, maybe with a you know a little bit of upgrade or change here or there. But you know, I I don't think they lose money on the car, Gary. And that technology gets gets filtered through the brands and through the other lineup pretty quickly now. Mercedes used to use there used to be you did the S, and then you'd have to wait to the next E to get it to come down, but. Even with some of the, the um, technologies that have been coming out on A class and C class, really close, so they're not waiting for that same same cadence, especially on the the um, infotainment side, which is what people are interested in, and that uh, does help sort of the the cost and making money on these things. Um, and you know, to John's point, Mercedes has a history of just dumping every bit of engineering they can into that, and and developing an amazing thing. It'll be interesting. 
um, at one point to sit, if you could get over the opportunity to sit in a, in a Lucid Air sedan and then get into a Mercedes S class five minutes later and which one as you sit in it makes you feel special. I don't know the answer to that question yet, um, but it will be interesting to see and, and and that's a very intangible element to it. You can have you know the same types of leather and the same types of things in there, uh, but what makes you feel special? And at that price point, boy, you better feel special sitting in that car. Yeah, I, I love your test there. You get, getting you know from the S class into the Lucid Air. I like that idea. I'd like it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How fast can you make that happen? Well, you Good know the S class. The, the S-Class got a lot of uh, criticism for its styling. And, you know, people said, oh, they barely changed it. But I'll say this, and I learned this a long time ago, in, in the luxury end, when you're talking $100,000 and above, as an automaker, you can make a bad mistake coming out with a new S-Class that doesn't look anything like the other S-Classes because you instantly obsolete them. You piss off the customers who just bought the old one last week, the last of the models, and now you come out with something good and uh, that's, you know, just wow. And they feel like, holy crap, I bought the old one. And it also hurts residual values. So I, I'm not trying to defend the styling of it because I think it's kind of ho-hum. I'm just trying to explain they thought long and hard about it and they just evolved the design once again. So going back to your, your Comparo there, Stephanie of S-Class and Lucid, I, I, I think people are going to be more wowed by the Lucid uh, from the exterior styling just because they're going to say, oh, I've, I've, I've seen that S-Class before. That's not new, whereas the Air is brand new. Right. I, I agree with you 100% on that. And it'll be interesting. And Mercedes has had that criticism on the S class with other generations as well. And you're right, they make a they, they walk a fine line because, you know, that that is a is a very conservative purchase as expensive as it is. And it's all about how you feel on the inside of it. It's all about, and, and that includes power, powertrain, and it includes, you know, every bit of, of leather or massaging seats or infotainment. All of that is is part of it. It's how you feel on the inside and when, when you're in it, whether you're being driven or driving it, um, that ends up being a priority in that buyer. And the exterior needs to to communicate that power and it needs to, to, to look like it's special, but it doesn't necessarily have to, to, to look like the shiniest, newest design language in, in town. I mean, carrying over that conservative look works for them, has worked for them. And so we'll so basically both of you guys are making this argument as to, as to what Elon Musk can use to say why the Model S has looked like the Model S since June of 2012. I realized I just walked into that. <laughs> and right. you're right. So, you know, and, and that does, you know, Elon can just go, well, I'm just going to sit there. Although. Um, <laughs> I don't want to dis disappoint any of my customers. So I'm just going to keep it the same. Well, there's a difference between being conservative about your styling redesign and not redesigning at all. But, you know, uh, if, if, if you go back to an S class of 2012 and you look at the upgrades over the decade, you'll go, huh. Yeah, they really did change that. Yeah. Tesla did a front end facelift, which I think was a, a real terrific improvement, but it hasn't changed anything since. It's all the software updates, which is great. But, you know, there's a reason why they change out the window displays of uh, department stores. You know, every few months, it's got to be fresh. It's got to look new. That's what people go for. And look at sales of the, the Model S. And X not doing mm -hmm. so hot. So, so, so John, since, since we don't have Sandy here, I'm going to have to ask you this question. Okay. People are making a huge deal about the aluminum casting machine that they're talking about putting in the Tesla Berlin plant that is supposedly going to cast the entire rear end. It's going to consolidate 70 pieces into one. And everybody thinks this is, this is a magnificent thing. And I was thinking about that. And, and one of the things that occurs to me is nobody's talked about the tooling for that. Yes. Great, Gary. <laughs> Only you would think of that. I mean, this is going to be a Rube Goldberg of a casting machine. Extraordinarily complicated. And there's only one. It goes down, your whole plant goes down. So I, look, I, I like what Tesla's doing, the parts consolidation and all that. 
good thing. They don't have a great manufacturing record. They really don't. And now he's putting all his hopes on the most, the biggest and most complicated casting machine in the world. But it's a, you know, ultimately they'll get it to work. But my guess is they're going to go through a lot of teething problems. What do you think, Gary? I mean, you, you got the. I, I just, I just think, I, I think that the problem that that nobody's talking about is is the fact that the tooling itself is going to be so damn expensive, you know, which gets back to, well, we're not going to change anything for a very long time because by the time we amortize this, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be years and years and years. And to your point, if something goes wrong, they're screwed. There is no plan B. <laughs> that's right. Well, maybe that's the, you know, burn all the boats because you better succeed because you're not going back. But Gary, I thought you go. Let, let's go back to Nikola for a moment. I thought you were going to bring up uh, this investment company Hindenburg that put out this big release with a long list of what they're alleging are a bunch of lies and innuendos and hoodwinking on the part of Trevor Milton. Well, I mean, basically, the reason I didn't is is that I mean, I don't know what that firm is, and I mean. I, I don't know if you how much of that document you read, but I mean, I sort of get a sense that it's a guy and not a whole bunch of people. And one guy, possibly, because there's only one name when you go about the company. It only mentions the founder's name, and uh, you'd think, um, Steph, maybe you know something about this firm. I do not know anything about this firm, and I am not really gonna get into whether. Or but not you know, I mean, the, the, the whole thing about—I mean, if, if we're talking about Tesla, or we're talking about Nikola, or we're talking about you know a number of these these companies. I mean, it's people who are not enthusiastic about the auto industry; they're enthusiastic about the stock market, yeah. and 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 you know, so so they they're they're just looking at it from the point of view of that. And, and John, as you were saying earlier, I mean, okay, so so Trevor is is very entrepreneurial, very much a salesman, very you know proud of what he's doing, and PT and, and, Barnum, he's PT Barnum. Come on, exactly. And so, and 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 as you said, why is he doing that? He wants to raise cash. I mean, what what OEM does or OE CEO doesn't want to do that. Yeah. And well, you, know, his, you know, the other thing, why would you name an investment firm Hindenburg? <laughs> I mean, it went down in flames. It done blowed up. I mean, come on. So number one, I think it's a stupid name for an investment company. Right. The other thing, at Gary, and you noted it too, there's some factual errors in the accusations that the guy from Hindenburg's making. You know, he alleges that Bosch is a truck manufacturer, which everybody in the industry knows that it's not. But here's the, the, the key thing. He has shorted Nikola stock. Then he comes out with this long list of accusations against Nikola. And what happens? The stock goes down. So since he shorted the stock, this guy's made a pile of money on it. I have a big ethical problem with companies doing that sort of thing. And now I, I'm not going to exonerate Trevor. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say that Nikola is the greatest thing. I don't even know if the company's going to work or not. We had Trevor on the show because I knew it was going to be a good show and it was a great show. But I would not, for all the critics out there looking at Nikola, I would put no credibility in an investment company called Hindenburg that shorts the stock and then comes out and attacks the company to drive the price down. All right, so let's let's move on to a non-financial thing. So, um, in a couple of weeks, the Beijing Auto Show is supposed to occur. Um, you know what's interesting about that is apparently um, they're not going to have a whole bunch of car companies from the West exhibiting there. Now, next spring, we're going to have the New York Show the Detroit show and the LA show. And I think maybe I got the last two out of order. So Stephanie, two questions to you. One is, you know, is, is this thing in Beijing just sort of like a hail Mary that they're saying, okay, things are normal. That's question number one. And question number two is next spring, 
when the car companies are faced with three in a row, I mean, three very, very closely spaced auto shows, um, is, is this conceivably going to cause the death of one or more of them? Well, we've been talking about the death of auto shows for six or seven years, and they're not dead yet. So I'm not going to call it the death of an auto show. But with this, and I'll go to this stuff in the spring, um, with with uh, the Beijing show, it's a bit of wait and see. I, I'm not quite sure how that's going to turn. I know we did have a couple of auto shows in India, so there's definitely been some, some regions that are willing to try this anyway. Um, but one of the things that automakers, one of the decision points, well, which show they're going to use, has to do with when the car is going to go into production, when they want it to go in on sale. And so you've got three major shows within three and a half months of each other. It's not like the vehicles that they were going to show in this fall are they're just going to wait until spring because we're driving them now. So automakers are still on their same cadence for introducing the vehicles. We may feel we may see three very dry shows just because they're spread out. Um, and they're not going to have more product. The the products that were slowed down, the products that have not had the type of auto show reveal that they would have had this fall, they're not waiting until next spring to do it. So where's there's not a backup. There's not a backlog of, of a bunch of cars looking for a show at that point. It's the same as they would have had amongst the two shows before. So it'll be interesting to see how many we, we have at that point. And still, we're also looking at two auto shows changing dates, Detroit changing to June and, and um, LA changing to May, and um, Detroit in particular changing their format, LA talking about changing the format a little bit. So there's also a lot of variables going into those shows. And it's really hard to figure out which one matters most when you're changing a schedule, you're changing the fact that, that we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, whether we'll have a vaccine, how much social distancing is gonna make um, a difference in these attendances. And like I said, automakers are still rolling out their product. They're not waiting until next spring because that's when the show is gonna be. Um, with all of that change, it's, it's gonna be a really bizarre season. And, and I don't think that we can walk away into that season or out of that season and say, this is what's going to happen to auto shows forever because of changing 55 variables <laughs> at one time. Good, bizarre, bad, bizarre, or just bizarre? Just bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, John? Well, I hadn't thought of it before until you asked the question, but it, it just hit me when you did. New York show, Auto Show, April. LA Auto mm -hmm. Show, May. Detroit Auto Show, June. That isn't going to work. No way is that going to work. <laughs> and March is, Geneva, no, Geneva's not going to be in March. No, Geneva's no. gone. Geneva's right. dead as far uh, as we know yeah. right now. Yeah. So, I mean, Detroit's, pro you know, they can probably count on the big three to be at that show. So th there'll, there'll be at least that aspect to it. Uh, the the import brands that do well on the West Coast, I guess they're, they're going to be at LA. I, I don't know about New York. I don't know. And, you know, look, you, you heard Tim Herrick earlier in the show say nobody at GM is going back to the office until June of next year. So, you know, will there be a vaccine in time for the New York show? Will it be widespread? Will it be readily available? Uh, boy, I, I'm glad I'm not running an auto show, man. I would not be sleeping right. tonight. And, you know, to the point of GM not going back to the office until June, I mean, when you talk to OEMs now, they're worried about their own people. It's not it's not just the, the cadence of the shows and, and what's there. In order for them to staff a show booth, they have to they have to have employees willing to go do that. And if their employees are still scared to do that, you, it's, you can't really make them go feel like they're putting their life at risk to, to show off the new car. So that element, we don't know quite, quite how it's going to play in there. So it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be quite messy. And I think that there might not be enough product to fill three shows at that time frame. Even okay, if, so even so if it's going smoothly, there's not necessarily enough product in that three month period to fill all three shows. All right. All right. Let, let, let me, let me throw in a counter to, to, to both of these things. Okay. To both of you guys. So let's say for the sake of argument that there is a vaccine and let's say for the sake of argument, most everybody has gotten the vaccine by March, okay? March. Isn't it conceivable 
that there's going to be so much pent up demand by people in New York and Detroit and Los Angeles and the surrounding areas that damn it, you could have basically three cars in right. Cobo <laughs> arena and I'm going to see it. That may be, ha that may happen. You know, that that's a great point, Gary, because the pent up demand is going to be on the part of the public. You know, we in the media, yeah. Auto shows don't need the media anymore. I mean, they need the media to gin up attention in the local region, but that's it. Because look at all the, the new vehicles that we've been talking about that have been revealed online. I don't know the numbers, but I'll hazard a guess that the OEMs are stunned at the amount of coverage that they're getting and are seeing that they're getting all the ink, as it were, even digital ink, that they would have gotten had they done a very expensive reveal chock full of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so they're doing these online reveals at a fraction of the cost and getting all the media coverage that they need. So maybe that aspect is, you know, coming to, back to your point, Stephanie, if there's not enough new product to go to all three shows, but to your point, Gary, yeah, I, I can see where the public would be lining out the, you know, lines around the building to try to get in as long as everything's safe to do so. Because in terms of, of consumers, I mean, I was thinking about sort of media introductions without a new product. There are consumers who haven't seen the things that have been coming out. And so from a consumer's perspective, there should be a lot that they haven't seen before. But in terms of new model introductions, there may not be as yeah. much going on. Yeah, they they could have you know they could have folding chairs and and just you know it doesn't just anything in there and people go yeah let's go see that it, it could be <laughs> it could be because yeah people are, are ready to to go out and do something. Look, we gotta, right, wrap we, we gotta wrap it there because yeah, it's like I mean a, ha a happy we, we a could happy go on, but I mean, mean. <laughs> Steph, thanks so much for coming Thank on the you. show. Hey, it's always fun. I'm glad to be here. Thanks again. Thank you. Good. And, and Gary, we get to do it again next week. Indeed we do. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. And by Keykurt, technology that leads. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.